and those of you online, uh, welcome, by the way. God bless you. We pray the Lord will bless you today. We're continuing our series in Genesis. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 4, we're going to look at the story of Cain and Abel. And, and as you're doing that, uh, let me just mention about, again, they mentioned the uh, Bible classes starting, the Sunday school for adults starting uh, the first Sunday of December. There's some new topics there. And, uh, you know, for your elementary age, you know, the graded Sunday school is important because they learn, the, they're, they're, they're not biblically illiterate. They learn the word every time. And, uh, you know, like they go over every basic story in the Bible at an age appropriate level. It's different than kids church is happening now. It's at 10 o'clock. We have classes for adults because we study the word. And some, some new classes that we have here, we, we've got marriage matters, is some especially get geared toward younger couples and families. We have love languages of children. If you have children, let me tell you, if you, we need to be better at parenting. It's important because the church can do what they can do, but you're the one that's responsible for your children's spiritual lives. And, uh, and so that's a great class you need to plug in first Sunday of December. And then there's Bible study methods. And uh, that's, uh, you know, I think that's back going to be in the, the Yulstead Chapel. I don't know where the other classes, but pick up that, that uh, uh, then there's several other classes, but pick up the uh, brochure that tells you what the classes are. So uh, if, you're, if you just feel a little bit stagnant, plug into a home group, a small group, if you'd like to lead one. Uh, when we did the adult education, we flipped the, uh, the elementary ed to adult spaces. We put two of those as uh, uh, class, as rooms that are like set up like a living room. Why we do that? Because every night it can be used. You can invite people and it has a home atmosphere and it's a very warm atmosphere to be able to have a small group. Some people, they live a little bit far out and people, maybe they don't want to even host one. They would because people would have to drive out. But if you drive in, others nearby can go and meet you there. Or maybe your house, you feel it's too small, or you have other issues with uh, being able to host uh, in your home for whatever reason it might be. Now we have a place for you to host a small group, and we hope that you'll take advantage of that and rise up because it is about relationships with God and with each other. And you'll see this morning in the message that anytime there's sin, anytime there is, there's relationships that break down with God. You block the relationship with God, sin does, and it affects relationships with human beings, with each other, in your family, in your spouse, you know, everything with your children, every relationship at work, everywhere, sin is a problem. So uh, I was going to read to you uh, a, a, a precious uh, text that I got, uh, and I, I want to, and I agree with this. This is uh, so much truth. Tonight I'm speaking on the demise of America, and uh, uh, and you you will want to hear this. I'm going to go to the more, more current history of nations rise and fall, and what caused nations to fall. And we're seeing some of these things in America right now. And uh, this is someone that I have the highest regard for and respect. This said to me, "We can gripe about election integrity, but what about the integrity of voters, Christians, and pastors?" What we allow in our community, we'll elect. And uh, then it talks about, uh, you know, people that we elect, that we expect to carry out a platform that has a Bible base, and then they don't. They don't do that. And, and then it goes on and it says, uh, uh, members of both parties have abandoned our nation's foundational principles and even more violated the precepts of the God Almighty. This nation has relied on since the Mayflower Compact and been blessed by before we're, we, we were a nation. Well, his patience is long-suffering, but he doesn't bless America because we are great. America is great because he has blessed us. If we want that to continue, we have some serious work to do, starting in our hearts, in our homes, in God's house, now. And I'm talking about, in essence, from Cain and Abel, the condition of the human heart. The condition of the human heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Above all else, guard your heart, 
For everything you do flows from it. The NLT says, um, guard your heart above all else. It determines the course of your life. And the issue with Cain and Abel, uh, when Cain's heart was the issue. Now, sometimes when we read this story, when Abel's offering, which was an animal offering, giving up an animal, we, we have been taught or maybe we've heard the reason that Cain's offering wasn't is because it was a, it was a harvest offering. It was food offering. But the Bible is clear, it's, it receives both of them. And when you look at this story, it, the, Cain wasn't rejected because he didn't offer a blood offering. That is not what happened here. He's rejected because his heart. And as I read this, I want you to understand something. Often when, uh, when a uh, offering is received to God, sometimes uh, the fire will burn it or God will, will somehow make it known this offering is acceptable, right? And I don't know how, but when we read this passage, I want you to understand, I believe everybody knew that Cain's offering wasn't right. And so I thought about us as offerings that you, with the, you can pay the tithe to the penny. Jesus dealt with that with the, with the religious leaders and he called out their heart. And he said, Jesus said, where your heart is, your treasure is. In other words, it's, you can buy the legal amount of the law, give exactly what God says you gotta give, but your heart not be right. You can give regularly and serve regularly and your heart not be right. Only God knows the condition of your heart, but he knows it. And everything we do, we need to do with the right heart. We can do things so people will go, oh, look at you, you're good. We can do things so that we appease ourselves or feel good about ourselves. But we need to do everything we do from giving and serving and worshiping. Everything is to honor God with a heart toward God, to worship God and be pleasing in his sight. A sweet savor, a smell. So many times we find our identity in religious activity, and but we don't have that relationship that's alive and fresh. And this is the problem that we see repeated from Adam and Eve when they fell in the garden. And they made their, their, their excuses, and they hid from God. They ran. We see Cain did the same. So we look at this sermon. The title is Deja Vu which means here we go again. This sounds familiar. We just saw the same behavior in chapter three and in my life. I can say deja vu because I have been Cain, though I never murdered anybody, but I have hated somebody before. And Jesus says, if you hate, you same we've got the murder in your heart. Let me ask you something. This, this hit me like a brick right between the eyes this week. The people that have a different ideology than you in any area of life people that their behavior is detestable to you people that you just don't like what they think what they say who they are you just don't like them do you are you willing to pray God's mercy for them are you willing to pray God's spirit of grace be upon them? Or are you like, call a fire God and, and consume them? You receive mercy by the mercy you give. And you receive grace by the grace you give. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. It's all pretty serious stuff about your heart. But I don't think you can interact healthy with others until you get the heart of God in you, which we know in giving his own son what that is in giving Jesus. You see, this relation, this, this thing with Jesus, this religion, this, this Christianity affects your relationship with people, not just church people, not just family, all people, all people. We have to love deeper, forgive more, be more merciful, be more gracious. In Genesis 4, we read the story as we continue our series in Genesis. Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth 
to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel. Notice not the offering. He looked with favor on Abel, but not on Cain. It had to do with the heart, not the offering. It was the heart in the offering. He looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So, so it has to do with as we're giving. See, you can pay your tithe and God won't have favor even though someone else paid the same tithe and he does have favor. Because what is the heart of it? Oh, I got to do it. I don't want to go to hell. I got whatever. Well, first off, God paying your tithe doesn't give you, get you to heaven, right? And sometimes not paying it won't, won't keep you out. I mean, I'm not going to judge that. I will say Jesus looks at the heart. He's the judge. When it says judge not, he's not talking about don't judge someone like use judgment. You better use judgment when you get married, right? When you hire somebody who you select as your closest friends. But judging is about eternal judgment. Like judging them when you die, you're going to hell. Or when you die, you're going to heaven. You don't know. Only God knows the heart. So we can't question why God made judgment here and on Cain's offering he on on Cain and his offering he rejected it but obviously there's a problem and we see that Cain in his response to this validates God not accepting his offering because look, you mean look, look how he responded. But on Cain, verse five again, but on Cain his offering did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Let me tell you, when we sin, God's always speaking. When we're not sinning, he's speaking. The problem is not God not speaking. It's not God not wanting to talk to you. Not God not wanting to, but I put God speaking this way, a God thought. And I learned to recognize that's from God. It's a thought, a God thought. Understand that? Like one time in my life, I heard an audible voice of God. One time. One long ago. But usually never. I can feel very strongly impressed and believe it's God. So he's, he's talking. Let me tell you that. Then the Lord said to Cain. He's talking to him. When you sin, God's talking. Why are you angry? Why does your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In other words, sin leads to sin, which leads to sin, and a heart that's not right will continue to decay. Have you ever seen how precious and innocent a baby is? Huh? Come on. Give it five years. <laughs> Human condition of the heart goes down in a hurry. It's because we're basically born selfish and in the, in the sin, uh, all men are born as the first Adam was sin and we all need to be born again to become like Christ. So he says, but if you do, do not do what is right. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. I mean, this is ridiculous. He hates his brother because God doesn't, he's jealous. This is crazy. Let's go out to the field. He's setting him up, isn't he? And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. So, you know, he's out and there's, there's no security cameras, All right, hidden in the corn. Now he is, he kills him. Verse nine, then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? Well, I don't know, he replied. Who's that sound like? Adam and Eve, huh? Lie, you, you sin and you lie. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You ever notice that we don't want to outright lie, but we'll just say something that kind of diverts so that we don't have to really answer? Well, let me tell you something. God is being pointed. He's asking your heart, where is it today? And he's asking you to examine your heart. I don't know, he replied. And my brother's keeper, the Lord said in verse 10, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. 
God is always saying, listen. Parents, have you ever done that with your children? Listen to me. Listen. In other words, don't just hear the words like hear in your heart. Listen. Listen. It's important. Your blood, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood in your hand. You know, when Adam and Eve fell, he, 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 you know, when they sinned, he said, now you're going to have to work, you know, hey, Eve, you're going to have pain when you give childbirth. Hey, Adam, you're going to have to work the ground because now there's going to be thorns and weeds, right? Now it's going to be for Cain, consequence. What does sin always have? Sin equals consequence. Sin affects you. It's not helping you. For a moment, it seems like pleasure, the Bible says, but in the end, it bites you. We need to be holy. Verse 12, when you work the ground, this is the curse. It will no longer yield its crops for you. Buddy, not only are there thorns and weeds, I'm not even blessing the ground you work, buddy. You are, you, you've had it. You'll never forget this. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land that I will be hidden from your presence. Isn't that what sin does? It blocks us to be able to walk in the full presence of God because there's something between God and us. I mean, if he made it like there was nothing wrong, then we would never realize something's wrong here. We should be, we should be, you know, dealing with this in our lives so that we can make it right with God. I mean, if you, if you sense the presence and nothing ever changes when you're sinning and living in sin and doing, I mean, that's not God being loving to you, is it? Why do you think a parent says, go to your room? Separate them from them, to let them think about that. To go, this, this is a consequence. You're separated from me for a while. You go to your room. You sit there and think about what you've done. But Mabel, Cain says, that's more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence, yes. And I will be restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Yeah, it goes, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the law. You murder, you die. Punishment, death. Somebody's gonna kill you. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no, so that no one who found him would kill him. I don't know what that mark is. Nobody knows. I've read and read and there's nothing. And if somebody makes something up, just don't believe them because it's not in the Bible. Because there's plenty of people online that'll make anything up right here. I can tell you what some of those would be, but I'm not doing it from the pulpit. 16, so Cain went out in the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Jesus, make the word to us clear, to our heart, not just to our mind, not just to hear explanation of scripture, but your Holy Spirit message that pierces our hearts, that we bow our knee, invite you in to change our heart, oh God, make it new. As David prayed after he murdered and committed adultery, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me today. May we be honest and may we listen to your voice of correction as a father, your discipline, your, your conviction, and truly repent Examine our hearts, not be thinking about others, but before you, God, hear you. Get in our face, my face, all of our faces today, God. Speak loudly, and may we respond at the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, deja vu, because chapter four sounds like chapter three, and I see myself in this. I'm going, oh my goodness, I've been here before. You know, this temptation comes and I fall. This, you know, you know what I'm saying, or up. Uh, that hurt me, I got angry, I run my mouth, I, you know, talking out of turn, I shouldn't be saying that, I'm gossiping, I'm putting somebody down, I'm doing this, and you have these besetting sins. Hebrews 12, one says, where, it says uh, after chapter 11, the heroes of faith, 
He goes, now look at these witnesses, these people that have lived faith before you throughout the generations, where, whereby you are encompassed by, encompassed around. You're surrounded. You see all these heroes of faith, these witnesses and that. He says, let me urge you, lay aside the weight of sin that comes to you so easily and run the race uh, with faith, run the race, keeping your eyes on Jesus, the author, finish yourself, and lay aside the, the besetting sins. It talks about sins that are pattern sins that are deeply ingrained. And so we have to deal with the heart on an ongoing basis. We need to be responsive or else we will have this deja vu moment that's negative where we respond to temptation where we respond to the same data coming at us with the wrong attitude with a hatred with the temper with being angry with not telling the truth with whatever it might be we respond because we are not letting Jesus change our heart daily you see, sanctification is a word that begins coming, becoming like Jesus or in the process of becoming holy like God. Sanctified, Jesus said, sanctified. He's talking about his disciples. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth, he prayed. The word of God is true. And it's the word of God with the spirit of God that confronts us. It's God speaking that says, what have you done, Cain? Adam and Eve, where are you? Who told you you were naked? James Weaver, what are you doing? Did you just hear what you said? But we don't listen. We don't hear and we don't stop and we aren't honest with God. Truth in the inward parts is what David prayed because he understood that his heart was not responding to truth. And if you want to become like Jesus, you need the word and you need the spirit that makes it a sword that cuts you open and reveals who you really are deep in your heart where the issues of life flow from. It's your heart. You can look and do, you can have the religious rules. I don't do this and I do this. But your heart be far from God. The prophets of old told us with your lips you draw near to me, but your heart is far from me. Help our hearts, Lord. Help our hearts. The first thing I want you to see is that when we sin, God gives opportunity to confess and repent. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel, it says in verse 9. Similar to chapter 3, 9, in when, where are you when God asked Adam and Eve? See, God knows everything. The question isn't out of, God, of God's ignorance. The question is stemmed from the heart of grace. Do I have a picture of my grandkids up here? No, I, okay, I thought that was gonna get put in. My, sometimes that distant. Anyway, think about your grandkids, little ones, how innocent they look. But my grandkids do things that break my heart. And I try to be loving. You see, I ask you, what, who, who did this? What happened here? I'm not going to, it's not more, it's not as much about what they did, although what they did has consequences. When you take a knife and carve the sheetrock in the bedroom you're sleeping in. I'm not saying Sam did that, but he could have. <laughs> but, but I'm not sure if it's him or it could have been Paisley or Essie, but one of them did. One of them did. I've yet to have the right moment to explore that, so don't go talking about it to him, please. You see Sam traumatized. What grandpa told about oh no. So I see now an unsigned letter to a seven-year-old. You stupid little kid. Oh, wait, I get those. Those are pastor letters. Pastors get those unsigned letters. I throw them in the trash. They have no validity for me. They mean nothing to me, nor will I respond to them, although I haven't gotten one in 31 years. Maybe some of you send me one. They're kind of fun to toss and use them for some <laughs> firewood or something. But anyway, I don't do that to Sam. But, but anyway, I, I'm just telling you, like, I, I speak to him and ask what, what happened here, not because it's about what he did, but because of his heart. See, why, you know, it's not just about the damage. I don't even care. I'm going to leave it there because he did it. It's kind of like, cool, my kid did this, Right? A grandkid. I'm not gonna, I'm not that upset about it, but I am concerned what was he thinking, right? So 
God, when he speaks to us, is more concerned about the heart that made you do that than what you actually did. And he's quick to forgive. I mean, what one of you grandparent or parent would ever not quickly forgive if your child is honest and said, oh man, forgive me. I mean, what would you not forgive? Am I right? I mean, I don't care what they did. Your kid could commit murder and be in prison. You're still gonna love them and you'll forgive them. Yeah, but God won't forgive them. What, what, uh, let's see, King David, hmm. adultery and murder, God forgave him. By the way, he was old when he did that. Don't despise youth, Paul says to Timothy. Don't let anybody despise you because you're young. David's greatest feats were when he was young. Youth has nothing to do with it. It has walking with God. And sometimes we get older, we get in the form of religion and deny the power of God and we're not walking with God anymore. And we have all the information and we have the habits that are good religious going to church habits, but we're empty of the Holy Spirit of God. Keep the, keep the faith of your youth. Keep it stirred. Guard your heart. It'll take you down a path you don't want to go down. The wrong heart. As a father, I'm more concerned about the condition of my kid's heart than I am the mistake they made. It's the root, not the symptom. And so is God the Father concerned about the condition of your heart. You know, what have you done, James? Anyway, I believe God is trying to pull us to repentance. And it says, out of kindness, he leads us to repentance. And, you know... Like when, I, when I'm going to confront my grandkids, and I love my grandkids way more than I love my kids. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> but I'm going to confront them. It's out of love. It's out of restoration. I'm not going to let them get away with that stuff because I know it, that that's, not, that's going to lead them somewhere someday. So God is giving you opportunity this morning. If you will just hear, he's speaking. What are you doing? What have you done? Do you remember this? You know what I teach my fifth graders on Wednesday night? I've done this for many years and just went over it again. I said, when you lay down at night, you ask God to remind you of the day, anything you did that wasn't pleasing. And then you pause and you think about your day. When you think back about your day, I guarantee you God's going to remind you of anything you did that was wrong. This is the process of sanctification. If you don't do this, you're not growing more holy. And when God reveals to you what you did, you say, God, forgive me for that. And he's quick to forgive. And then, he, and, and then you pray, Lord, help me not to have that again. Change my heart. Help my heart. And then in the morning you get up and you say, God, remember yesterday I lied and I said a word I shouldn't have said. And I say, God, please help me today not do that again. Or yesterday I was talking ugly about someone. Or I disrespected my teacher. Or I lusted. Or I hated right? Help me not do that. That's the Holy Spirit will work on you. And so why? Why do I teach them that? Because we teach them Philippians 4, 8, which says the things that you think, you know, we can control. What, whatsoever is lovely, pure, just, good, you know, uh, good report. Uh, you know, I'm old and I can't remember. I used to be able to quote it, but it's that way. It says, think on these things. Think on these things. We can, we can choose what to think on. Okay, I want you to think about a big snowstorm out there and picture it blowing. It's cold. It's 22 below zero and it's blowing. The snow's that deep. Close your eyes and picture it. Now, now open them and think about my ugly bald head and my pot and cut bat, belly. That was, which one's more pleasant? They're equal, right? They're equal unless you're Jeannie Hill who loves snow. She needs to be set free from that disease. I love you, Jeannie. Montana mama. Uh-huh. Anyway, God has given you opportunity this morning. So if he speaks to you, I'm asking you to repent. Because here's what I teach, and this is what happened to you. The deja vu, it'll happen again and again. Because thoughts lead to actions. And if you think and you do it again, and you think and you do it again, the same thought leads to an action. Same thought leads to an action. Same thought leads to an action. A thoughts lead to actions. Actions lead to habits. It becomes a habit. It becomes a habit. Every time you're in trouble, you go, you lie like they do to God. Like, no, well, I don't know where my brother is. You lie and you, another kind, you get confronted. You lie. You have a pattern of lying. And so thought leads to an action. Action leads to a habit. You got a habit of lying. Now you're not just lying 
Habits lead to a lifestyle. You're a liar. When you lie one time, it doesn't make you a liar. It's when it's your lifestyle, you become a liar. And apart from the Holy Spirit working with your heart, you become a liar. Are you with me? The second thing we see, God gives us opportunity to confess and repent, is when we sin, the second thing, human pattern, is to lie or cast blame. And I pretty much covered that. But the woman, he said in chapter 3, uh, the woman gave it to me, Adam says, uh, and you're going to blame the snake. The snake gave it to me. Or it was my friends that did it, Mom. Or it was at work. I mean, they, they were doing it. I was just there or whatever. Oh, yeah, I, I was just in the car. It wasn't my pot when the cop pulled me over. That wasn't my keg in the back, the back seat. Make excuses. We lie. We run from God. It's easy to get frustrated with, when others deflect, blame, and deny. We get upset with our children or others. But we've done this. We all have. So uh, we need to keep in mind that when we sin, the human pattern is to run. Don't get defensive at God's voice when he speaks through a person. Listen, I've had people speak to me and confront me. Listen, through friends, leadership, other pastors, my mother, my father, my children, speak to me. Be open to a human voice that speaks to you so you respond not defensive. Don't deny, don't blame, don't lie. It'll lead to a calloused heart. Cain didn't just wake up one morning and commit murder. He developed a calloused heart. Verse 3 and 4 again, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel was brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, verse 5, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor, so Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. God wasn't displeased because it was a grain offering. He was displeased because his heart was impure. Don't ever forget that. Have you allowed something to callous your heart? Has your heart been changed? Slowly. That's the question. Where is your heart? Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Someone put a song to this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. This is a good prayer every day. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Otherwise, failure to do so can lead to strongholds and besetting sins. Let me tell you something. God makes bad things happen to you sometimes or allows them to so that it reveals your heart. God doesn't keep you from being tempted in the same way, though he doesn't tempt a man, because how you reply to that shows your heart. Why? So you can see your heart. When you continue to lose your temper, when you put people down, when you gossip, when you tear things down in the kingdom of God, when you do this, when you speak with hatred, it should, your words should reveal your heart. Out of the mouth, the heart, the heart speaks. Out of the heart, rather, the mouth speaks, but it goes both ways, doesn't it? We got, it's a heart issue, isn't it? So when we sin, the third thing is God will discipline and provide. In Hebrews 12, it talks about a father, a good father, disciplines. Look at this. It says, through, starting at verse 5. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children, he said? My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who's never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does uh, all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Verse 9, since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is good for us always so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable what is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Discipline is needed. Are you grateful for God's discipline? He's always speaking, but do we hear him? God said to Adam and Eve, he confronted their sin. God said to Cain, 
He confronted his heart in his offering. So what does God provide? He provides clothes for Eve, for Adam. He provides forgiveness. He provides the Holy Spirit inside and the word to help us overcome. Protection for future consequences, the mark on Cain. You've had your punishment, but you're not gonna face those consequences. You've been, you've been, you've, you've been dealt with, but I'm not gonna continue to beat you. I put you in your room for an hour, but not every day am I gonna put you in your room because of what you've done. The final thing I want you to see is when we sin, the human pattern is to complain and run. My punishment is more than I can bear, verse 13 says. And a sure sign of a calloused heart is when you're more concerned about your punishment or your suffering than you are about your sin. Did you hear me? A sure sign of a calloused heart is when you're more concerned about the consequences or, or the suffering than you are about your sin. I can't believe I'm grounded. I can't believe my wife is making me stay at a friend's house. I can't believe if you're a child, I, you lost your treat or had to go to bed early or whatever the punishment. So verse 16 says, so Cain went out of the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. We, we wanna be in God's presence. Sin blocks relationship with God and relationship with each other. And as a result of Cain's callous heart, he runs. He runs to a different land, the land of Nod, east of Eden. He separates himself from God and from others. That's what sin does. It always leads to broken relationships of what matters the most, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, our relationship with Jesus Christ, and loving our neighbor as ourself, our relationship with people. Sin always does that. It feels like deja vu to me because I've been down these paths and I'm preaching to myself. But let me tell you, can we reverse the deja vu? Can we begin to, when, the, when we're tempted, to go, oh, I recognize this. I'm not doing that again. And you start making a pattern of overcoming. You start making a pattern instead of running from God and lying, saying, yes, Lord, it's me, and running to God. Can we change the deja vu? Can we change that we have a history of always running to Jesus Christ to heal the broken relationships, to be forgiven, to run to the Father's arms? Imagine Cain repenting. Remember past, last week, Luke and August made the point, sometimes God gives you what you want so that you can see what you need. You need. And God came, gave Cain what he wanted, yet he still blamed God and complained. It's time to quit running from God and blaming God and start running to God. Would you stand with me? And if today you need to run to the heart of the Father in His kindness, He's speaking and saying, what are you doing? What have you done? Or any other need, you need healing, you need anything. Online the same. As we begin to sing right now, I run. Would you come and you come to this altar right now? Going out the back door is not the direct direction to go unless you're going to serve. Coming here is the direction. You know what an altar is? It's a place they offered sacrifices for their sin, animals. And the Bible says we are living sacrifices. We're offering ourselves. So we come to the altar of God and say, here I am, Lord. I'm yours. So move right now as we begin to see you.